Paul and Kale once remarked that uh, half of the most entertaining movies in Hollywood were written by Jules Furthman, and the other half were written by Ben Hecht. And she wasn't really exaggerating too much. Ben Hecht was one of the great screenwriters of all time, maybe the best. Hecht started as a newspaper man in Chicago. He's a legendary figure for newspaper reporters like myself, old, old reporter. He wrote a great uh, autobiography, Child of the Century. It came out in 1954. He also wrote Gaily Gaily, all about his wild adventures in Chicago in the 1920s. Then he came to New York and he hooked up with Charles MacArthur and they, they were a playwriting team. And they wrote a great play, The Front Page, which is still the best play about newspapers. It's been filmed a number of times, including as His Girl Friday with gender reversal. It works every time they do it. And uh, it's a love story between two men, non-sexual, but a, a reporter and a managing editor who are kind of fighting, but they, they're very tight with each other. And then Hector MacArthur wrote 20th Century, which was a, a wild farce about the theater, which was a hit and was made by Howard Hawks into a film. Hecht was highly regarded in Hollywood for his uh, versatility, for his speed. He famously rewrote Gone with the Wind in one week when David O. Selznick, the producer, realized the script wasn't working, so he stopped production, which is very expensive, and spent a week having Ben Hecht working around the clock rewriting the script. And he was horrified to find out that Ben Hecht hadn't read the book, which everybody else in America had read. And, and so they had to tell him the story, and he thought the story was very bizarre, but he cranked out the script. He insisted on getting paid every day, $1,000 a day, I think, for a while was his fee, so he got very well paid for his work. But Design for Living was uh, right up his alley because it was about artists and it was about thumbing your nose at social conventions, which was very much a Ben Heck theme. The play was a brand new hit play by Noel Coward, who had done Private Lives earlier, which was you know, probably the best romantic comedy play ever written. But Design for Living was written by a coward for himself and Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine, who were a married couple who were among the great names of the American theater. And they were close friends, and Coward had been looking for some kind of way to put the three of them together. And he conceived this vehicle in which uh, he said it's about three people who love each other very much. And uh, it's, it's a body uh, menage a trois in which uh, the woman shares the sexual favors of the two men at different times and uh, sometimes at the same time. And there's a lot of uh, uh, fairly shocking uh, sexual interchanges for, the, for 1933. It was considered very outré. Ernst Lubitsch, his primary screenwriter, was Samson Rafelson, who was also a playwright. And Lubitsch offered him Design for Living, and he turned it down, saying in later years that he had told Lubitsch it was another goddamn sophisticated triangle. He said, you need Noel Coward like you need a hole in the head. I'm just guessing, but maybe Rafelson was reluctant to go up against Noel Coward because Coward was sort of the theatrical equivalent of Ernst Lubitsch. He was the epitome of... Uh, sophisticated repartee and sophisticated comedy and sexual farce and innuendo. And um, for any writer to rewrite Noel Coward was asking for it from the critics, and the critics uh, unfairly dumped on the film for that reason without looking at the merits of the film. And so Lubitsch turned to Ben Hecht. But Lubitsch thought that he would work with Hecht the way he did with Rafelson, which was in the same room every day very closely, but Hecht was not used to working that way with directors, and certainly not with the director who was as strong and determined to have his way as Lubitsch was. And Lubitsch later told Rafelson uh, they wasn't used to each other. So they grudgingly collaborated, and uh, Lubitsch contributed his share of dialogue, I'm sure, and his characterizations. And I think the main thing that Lubitsch should get credit for in this script was structure. He was quoted at the time as criticizing the play because he said the opening was very dull because the characters were talking about what they did before, uh, talking about the past, which he said doesn't work very well on film. And that's usually a good rule of thumb in a film. You should show things instead of talking about them. And the play starts with um, one of the characters, Leo, the playwright, who's Tom in the film, has already become successful, and he's off in London. And Lubitsch thought that was dull, so he eliminated that. And so the film starts with the three characters meeting each other on a train. It's a wonderful meet cute, as they used to call it in Hollywood. The writers were always trying to devise clever ways for characters to meet, and this is one of the most delightful. 
the two men are asleep and Gilda is drawing them, it establishes right away that she's an artist and that she's kind of in control because she's doing a portrait of them. And it's all pantomime for quite a long time. And it's a kind of silent sequence that Lubitsch loved to do because he came from silent film and loved to do silent scenes in his films. And, and it's uh, kind of cheeky because here you have this play which is known for verbal wit and you're starting with a long silent sequence. And then they start talking and it's in French, which is funny. Lubitsch loved to do that kind of unexpected verbal thing. And to hear Gary Cooper speaking French is, is very unexpected and funny. And even if you don't know French, the audience would sort of get from their body language what's going on in the scene, and he liked that kind of humor as well. He showed them together in their garret in Paris and had fun with the poverty, and there's a funny scene where she throws herself on a bed and a cloud of dust rises from it, which is a real Lubitsch touch, to show their living in squalor. And he knew that milieu. He had made a wonderful film called De Flamme in uh, Germany before he came to America, which was about Bohemian Paris. It's a tragedy, it's a stark tragedy, but it deals with the same kind of characters in an earlier time period. Um, so he knew and he identified with struggling artists. And it's, I think it's interesting to see people struggle and have ambitions and, and uh, how they achieve their ambitions. I think that's... Uh, satisfying for the audience instead of just hearing that somebody is off in London as a successful playwright. What does that mean? Because you don't know the guy, you haven't met him yet. Um, he's already a success, so you don't know anything about the struggle that went on. Peanut brains, parasites. The film is more about how they became a success, and it gives Gilda a lot more credit for, for that because you see her bringing out their confidence and, and forcing them to stop talking and get down to working and things like that, and that's much more interesting, I think, dramatically. If you can't believe in yourself, believe in me. I'm no good. Uh, ben Hecht, uh, being a man of the theater, had a lot of fun with Tom, I think is almost like a self-portrait by Ben Hecht of the young playwright. There is some very funny scenes where he's struggling to come up with lines for his play. And then when he gets to be a success, when he goes to listen to the laughs of the audience, I think is very funny where he's, he knows where the laughs are supposed to come, but he gets anxious to make sure that the laughs come. And then when they do, he's got this very smug smile and he, his vanity as a playwright is, is uh, exploited by Van Hecht with great glee. And I'm, I'm sure that Heck put that kind of thing in there. So. And some of Gary Cooper's lines, angry lines about art and, and morality and attacking middle class morality, and you know, has, has a lot of the Ben Hecht ring to it. The play has uh, three acts, it goes from Paris to London to New York. The film kind of does that too, but the, the action that takes place within each act is quite different from what happens in the play. And in the play, the characters are Europeans, are probably uh, British, and uh, they speak in a certain clipped uh, understatement that Coward was famous for, and uh, they're kind of upper crust people who are slumming or being artists and um, living a bohemian lifestyle. But in the film, they're Americans, and just having brash American stars playing the roles offended certain critics who wanted something, you know, more conventionally sophisticated. Here you had Gary Cooper, who is not known for sophisticated comedy, being cast very much against type, actually, because he was known for his laconic, yup, nope, delivery. And here he's very voluble and fast-talking, and he has a bad temper, which is sort of an interestingly unusual for him. Frederick March, uh, who I personally find sort of lugubrious uh, in most of his films, kind of heavy-handed. He's very light and gay in this film in the old sense of the word, very jolly and fun, uh, except for moments of lugubriousness that creep in once in a while. But he's not normally the kind of actor you'd have playing a, a light comedy, although he had done The Royal Family of Broadway uh, a few years before that, where he was kind of a light takeoff on John Barrymore, and he was very good. Gilda is played by um, Miriam Hopkins, who is Lubitsch's favorite actress. He had done two films with her, which are both wonderful. The Smiling Lieutenant, where she plays a shy princess who becomes sexually liberated, and Trouble in Paradise, which I think is his greatest film. It's uh, the best romantic comedy in films. And so this film uh, is another great part for her. She's very uh, lively and spunky. 
Have you ever heard of a playwright called Thomas Chambers? No, never. You've never read a play. She was from the South, and she had this lovely Southern accent, and she was uh, very kind of wisecracking and and uh, tough in a certain way, but charming and sweet. She's got everything going for her, and she really knocks this role out of the park. I think. Uh, and she's better, the, the role of the woman is better in the film. In the play, she's secondary to the men. And um, the men have more time on stage than she does. But in the film, she really dominates the, the action and the two guys, she runs their lives more than she does in the, in the play. And in the play, there's even a, a scene in which uh, she gives a speech criticizing her gender, which is totally antithetical to Lubitsch, who loved women and celebrated women in his films. There's, there's one unfortunate line in the film where she talks about helping the two guys to be successful in their art. And she says, I'm going to be a mother of the arts, which is funny. But then she says, my, my work doesn't count, which today's audience is a little dismayed by that, I think. Um, but she's an interior decorator in the play and in the film she's a commercial artist and more emphasis is placed on her art in the film, her, her job. In the 1930s, women tended to have jobs in films and later they didn't. We're going to concentrate on work. In, in this film, one of the refreshing things is that the woman behaves like a man in the sense and she says that I'm doing what men usually do, which is try on a lot of hats is the way she puts it metaphorically. Lubitsch loved metaphors try on a lot of men, basically, before you find the one you want. And then the two men say, well, which one do you want? And she sighs and she says, both. It's a wonderful moment. Now, how many films back then would do that? I mean, I can't think of any really, you know? So she's, she's a woman who loves two men at the same time, and that's considered fine with Lubitsch, you know? Lubitsch and Hecht had to deal with censorship to some extent. There was a limit to what they could say or do in Hollywood in 1933, even though the code had not been enforced strongly until the following year. The production code was in place, but it was more um, loose until 1934 when they really cracked down on sex and films, partly due to Mae West and other people really pushing it. And so when Paramount tried to reissue Design for Living in 1934, the code refused to let them reissue the film, and so the film kind of vanished. The stork brought us. But in 1933, they got away with an awful lot. But how did he get away with that? Well, part of it, one of the censors once said of Lubitsch, we know what he's saying, but we can't figure out how he's saying it, so we can't cut it. But it still rings. The Lubitsch touch, which people talk about, is complicated to define, but one of the characteristics is ellipsis. He told Billy Wilder, let the audience add it up and they'll love you for it. And Wilder said most directors say two plus two equals four and one plus one plus one equals four. And But Lubitsch just said two plus two, you know, and let you add it up. And so he didn't make it as explicit and crude as, as a lot of directors would do, and that kind of stuff is what the censors would be looking for to cut. And uh, then he would do things that were ironic, like having Miriam Hopkins say, let's have no sex. And you would kind of think, well, wait a second, they can't really live together in this little place without having sex. So he was reliant on a lot of suggestion, and that's hard to censor. Lubitsch was famous for not exactly disrespect for literary sources, but just being free with literary sources. He made Lady Windermere's fan, the Oscar Wilde classic play, into a film in 1925 and used no Wilde epigrams at all, even in the inner titles. But it was a silent film, so people didn't expect maybe to hear Wilde's dialogue. And so he was praised for his cleverness in translating it into cinema and he didn't get that praise for design for living by and large people thought it was you know what is this this is an americanization of this play and uh, the dialogue is all gone and there's only one line of dialogue left in the film from the play good for our immortal souls which they kept in as a kind of a gag i guess good for our immortal souls bad for our stomachs People always talk about the Lubitsch touch, but I think you can also see the Ben Heck touch in this film. Uh, I believe in multiple authorship. I think most films, you can say, have more than one author, and uh, that's not a disparagement of the director. And Lubitsch was a very strong director with a great vision. Uh, every frame of his films was his. But there's a certain flavor to this film that's a little different from the normal Lubitsch film. 
And I think the fact that he didn't work as closely with Hecht as he did with Rafelson and that Hecht resisted him a little was a sign of Hecht's strength of personality that he was going to put his own imprimatur on the film, whether Lubitsch liked it or not. And that actually is not bad for the film because the dialogue, Ben Hecht was known for a certain irreverence towards social institutions, which works well for the film. And he was very romantic in a kind of cockeyed, backhanded, funny way, certain cynical romanticism that works well for the film. See that you do, understand? Yes, sir. Because the characters are not into sloppy sentimentality and things like that, but they're very romantic in the way they live. And he also loved uh, artists and ne'er-do-wells and people who were disreputable socially. And that came from his newspaper days where he loved hanging out with disreputable characters and uh, punctured the pomposity of uh, public officials and uh, guardians of public morality, as you can see in the front page. I wouldn't want to be mixed up. You know how it is. It's a rather delicate matter. And you so he has a lot of fun with Edward Everett Horton being the prissy spokesman for conventional morality in the film. And I think the funniest part of the film is the last part where they invade uh, Plunkett's mansion, which is outrageous, but he kind of deserves it because it's, it's a marriage in name only. And, you know, in, in the play, it's implied that Ernest is gay and it's a, what they call New York marriage back then. Uh, but in the film, uh, it's not quite as clear that he's gay, but he, he tries to have sex with her on their wedding night and something goes wrong. And he kicks over these two tulips, which are very phallic symbols of Tom and George. But Horton is hilarious in his outrage double takes and his anger and all that is just a delight. I teach adaptation, among other things, to my screenwriting students, and a lot of films are adapted from other media. And one of the rules, and William Goldman said this, is that if you want to do a faithful adaptation of something, you have to tear it apart and rip it up and restructure it and rethink it. You, you just can't stick it on the screen the way it was written. It would be deadly. If you want to capture the spirit of something, you, you often have to change it around a lot. And Lubitsch and Hecht, I think, vastly improved on the play. But there is a certain coward spirit that does come across. And there's that kind of bohemian thumbing the nose at conventional morality, which is coming from Noel Coward. And also the experimenting with the new kind of relationship. Truffaut dealt with that in Jules and Jim, which is very influenced by Design for Living. Can three people live together and two men sharing the same woman? In that film, it doesn't work out at all. It's a tragedy, but it's fun for a lot of the film. Noel Card, in an introduction he made for a British TV production of the play, said the title was ironic and not dogmatic and applied only to the characters of the play. And I thought about that, and I think he's just wrong. Uh, D.H. Lawrence said, never trust the teller, trust the tale. And the tale, the play, uh, says the opposite. It says that this is a way of living, and it's uh, not telling you you have to do this, but it's saying that maybe this is a more honest uh, way to live than the conventional middle-class morality. And the characters uh, actually at great length uh, talk about that and, and defend their choices. And um, they're not proselytizing for that necessarily, but they're they're very forthright about how this is a, a good way to live, uh, uh, to have more sexual freedom and more open kind of relationship. And I think that that's part of what the play is saying, and the film is saying that as well. Uh, the play has certain gay overtones, perhaps, that make it a little more outré in that sense. But uh, Lubitsch, I think, is more free in accepting sexuality than Coward, who had to be kind of defensive about certain things, I think, because of the times in which he lived. Although I think in his own life and his mind, he was pretty free, but um, it, homosexuality was illegal in England at the time. But the play goes pretty far in implying the two guys have a love relationship between them. The film doesn't really do that as much. It's more heterosexual, but it's very generous about sexuality that basically Lubitsch really doesn't care what people do sexually as long as it's not hurting somebody.
said once that he didn't think too much about it. And that was kind of the attitude that authors had in those days. They weren't too proprietary. And I don't think the studios generally uh, would have allowed the author to have much influence on the work. Uh, but he, he is one of the three authors of the film. There's no doubt Lubitsch, Van Hechten, and Noel Coward all deserve equal credit, in my opinion. Uh, Coward gave this great idea for a film. And Billy Wilder said once, uh, a film is made or dies in the first seven seconds when you get the idea. He said, if the idea is no good, forget about it. No matter what you do, the film is not going to work. But if the idea is good, the film will work. And, here you have a good idea of three people who love each other very much, living together and having some problems, but working it out. And at the end of the play, the three of them laugh uproariously at middle-class morality, and they're going to be back together having their love triangle that's not exactly a love triangle in the sense of conflict. It's more like, let's try to all kind of share each other. And uh, uh, that's very unconventional. And the film gives a version of that. They're uh, in a taxi cab and they're kind of laughing and having a good time and you don't quite know where they're going to wind up or how it's going to work out. But it's a new adventure and, and that, that is the spirit of Noel Coward is that life is, as he said, an excursion. A cheap excursion is the way he put it in the play and uh, somebody gets offended by that. But um, he believed in travel and adventure and fun and shaking things up and, and that spirit comes across in the film. And they owe that to Noel Coward, I think.